<laughs> welcome, welcome everyone to another D-Day. Um, I saw already a lot of familiar faces, but also a lot of new ones. So my name is Andrea Bauer and this is Boris Moschkowitz. We are the initiators of D-Day. What is D-Day? Why are we doing this? Uh, with this format, we want to discuss uh, uh, effects of our digital era uh, to our everyday life. And for that, we organized these panel discussions to uh, discuss it with creative thinkers and uh, to um, help to establish a kind of a holistic picture on what's going on. And um, today, we talk about money. So the topic was the color of money, the myth of economics. And uh, we want to, uh, we try to understand today in our discussion what money was, what money is, what money will be. And for that, we uh, found two amazing panelists today. I'm very happy that the last one arrived finally. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, to introduce them, I hand over to Boris. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Wonderful. So yes, I'm also happy to see Thomas in person, Thomas Sadlacek, and uh, Manu Cesar Shamsrizi. Um, they both share, interestingly, a couple of moments in their lives. Um, I think they met at the St. Gallen Symposium, where they first discussed that they should do something in Germany, so I'm happy to, with Andrea, that we can host you and uh, discuss this, the future and history of money, or the history and future of money, whichever way you want to take it. And Thomas, obviously, is most known for his debut book, um, the Economics of Good and Evil, The Quest of Meaning from uh, Gilgamesh to Wall Street. And the book delves into mythology, theology, uh, sociology. Um, it feels um, something that takes you on a wild ride and leaves you with lots of new insights, um, how to view current culture and the influence of monetary systems. And I think that's something that uh, also both of them um, share that Manu Chaser is somebody who recently founded the NGO called Cryptos. It's uh, an NGO to furthering the acceptance and culture of uh, cryptocurrencies. And um, they um, both um, also Yale fellows, by the way, and I think that's uh, worth mentioning as uh, Yale Review uh, named Thomas one of the five hot top uh, economists in the world. I like the hot. The hot <laughs> and... and and I'm sure you'll prove how hot you are. And uh, and and, Man, and Man, Manu is, uh, uh, was the youngest uh, um, global justice Yale fellow in 2010 at the age of 23. So that's uh, pretty amazing. We've got two great minds here. And um, so I look forward to um, welcoming you both on stage and sharing your insights and uh, giving us all a better understanding of what we're looking at. Thank Please you. welcome Thomas and Manu. Thank you. So again, thank you for coming. Thanks for having you both here. Thanks Amazing. for having us. And um, yeah, I have the honor to have the first question, which goes to you, Thomas. Okay, I can take it. Yeah. <laughs> Boris already mentioned it. You, you wrote this book, which I really, I, I read it. And it I was enlightening. to all intelligent people <laughs> for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it wasn't that bad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, and the book is called the, Econ uh, the Economics of Good and Evil. And uh, my question to you is, what leads into an economy of good and evil? Why is this duality? Well, because we, I think we have, <coughs> in, in the age past, we have had the tendency to view economics as, as uh, something that is divine. It was perfect, it was self-regulating, it was omniscient, omnipresent, it, it had the keys to perfect rationality. It became the what I call the unorchestrated orchestrator. You cannot orchestrate it. Laissez faire, laissez passer, let it be. Don't meddle. It has its own logic, own rules that you cannot even comprehend. Mm -hmm. Only the priests can decipher the, the signals that it sends. By priests, I mean economists. They're the only ones who can interpret the, 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 the whims of these deities. So you cannot uh, orchestrate it. It must be unorchestrated. This mm -hmm. is it will orchestrate you. 
it will tell you what's the meaning of life it will give you values you can see that even today all our values have become a subset of GDP. For example, this is the debate that I hate the most, the, the creative industry. I even hate the connection, creative industry. That is, work. Is, is an oxymoron. But nevertheless, the only rule of, the only meaning of art, this is the debate that's going on in Europe. I, I imagine this must be quite alive here in Berlin, is um, that it's legitimate because it adds to GDP. And that's the only way that we can legitimize art. In, in the days gone, Oscar Wilde, you remind me a little bit of Oscar Wilde, actually. Take that as a compliment. Take that as a compliment, yeah. I think it must be the scarf. <laughs> um, in his famous foreword to the picture of Dorian Gray, this is you know, a very famous foreword that is very often quoted, he ends with the sentence, all art must be quite useless. By useless, he doesn't mean uh, uh, selling to be to be yeah. sort of, but exactly that art is exempt from the imperative which is otherwise predominant in our lives, and that's the imperative of you have to be useful, you have to be efficient, you have to be contributing, you have to be you know. Is that the evil part? Then? No, and art is exempt from that. And and my part was what I wanted to say that this God, a little bit like Nietzsche this god of economics is dead mm -hmm. he's non-existent it's only there is no invisible hand they're only our hands right hand and left hand and they can do good and evil mm -hmm. so my point there was that economics like any other institution be it democracy be it the rule of law be it journalism be it anything can be used of course it's not neutral it can be and it is becoming both good and evil and you, you cannot rely your moral judgment on the system which we call capitalism that mm -hmm. is my point okay. I, 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 if I could say it better I would not have wrote written a book of 400 <laughs> pages I, uh, yeah, I that's <laughs> convincing <laughs> but at this point let me ask M M Manu um, and I know as a student of Dirk Becker you're somebody who also likes to um, think things through from a meta perspective. Um, you try to have the holistic view. So when you hear well, it's good... It's the easiest view. <laughs> now, if that's easy, now, now listen, I, I would love to hear your um, understanding of good and evil. Or what is your inner compass? Oh, well, well first, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not only a student of Dirk Becker, but also of Tomasz, if you, if you want. So, um, um, and he, he pointed out to... Uh, um, the, the Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand. Um, there is another famous, yet not that quite famous, uh, concept of Adam Smith, with, which is uh, r usually wrongly translated. Um, in, in German you use uh, the unsichtbare Hand uh, versus um, the invisible judges, unsichtbare Richter. But that in Adam Smith's original uh, paper was described as an inner moral compass mm -hmm. um, and Smith was pointing out that that is something everybody has to come up with by him or herself um, taking that idea further my moral compass is quite flexible um, that doesn't mean that it's changing uh, for 180 degrees but it is um, I'm trying to accepting complexity by which I mean that I'm not sure what's the end result of my doing right now and I'm not sure if this is where I want my from a moral standpoint I want to go I can't be sure that that the path I choose will lead me there um, one one discussion we can look in uh, besides the GDP if that's a good idea as a measurement or not um, would be for example the speculations uh, investment banks do on um, any kind of food mm -hmm. um, which is as far as I know highly debated in, in economics um, and left me quite confused because I still don't know if that's a good thing to do or not um, I bet Tomas says it's it's not a good idea that's my feeling as well um, but then again my moral compass it would be quite helpful to have a clear yes or no option um, but those days seem to be gone or they maybe never even existed. No, it's interesting how this is shifting. And um, another thing that I mentioned before that you got involved with cryptocurrencies, 
Because in preparation of this talk, somebody asked me, so you have Thomas Sedlacek, and why are you talking about crypto? What, what's so digital about Thomas? And I said, well, we talk about we, we, we talk we talk about he's on WhatsApp. <laughs> we talk about the history and we talk about the the present. And if we talk about the future, this is something to take into consideration. So, how did you get involved with cryptocurrencies, and what is Cryptos, your NGO, about? Um, okay, so let me start by that. So Cryptos is Germany's first NGO looking at cryptocurrencies and the technology behind it um, and the impact that technology can have on philanthropy and society. So we are not um, focusing on a specific currency. We are not earning money by anything we do in that setting. It's a spin-off of the Global Shapers, the youth organization of the World Economic Forum. So um, we're trying to... Yeah, well, I, I, I did know that you're in the Global Council on Values. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> These meetings are very useful. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, but let me... Let, so, um, why I'm interested in cryptocurrencies, uh, there are many reasons. Uh, one of it goes back to the Lord of the Rings, and it's an inspiration I got from Tomasz as well. When very Tomasz good. was pointing out that you should look, if you're looking for how... If you want to know how economics... Um, will look like in a hundred years. His point was, have a look at how the elves uh, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings live. They have very little use for material, correct me if I'm wrong, right? They have very little uh, uh, emphasis on material things because all things they produce materially are of very high quality. Um, and they don't need to renew it every now and then, um, which gives them time and space and creativity and resources to look for visions and ideas and an, eco an, an economical setting mm -hmm. built up on different um, ideas and, and, and dreams to fulfill. And cryptocurrency as a digital version of um, money, or one version that could be, for me is a logical step into that uh, elfish economy. Interesting. It's a great Sounds pleasure beautiful. to become a spokesperson for the elves. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Much better than for the orcs. That's. Uh. Yeah. But let me follow up uh, on that question with you, Thomas. Um, when, when we talk about new forms of money, and I know that economist Hyman Minsky once said, creating money is easy. The hard part is getting it accepted. So um, how do you see the role of money changing? Well, to be useful in this debate, in my view, every currency is a cryptocurrency. It, uh, I mean, the, 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 the euros you have or the Deutschmarks you, you, you used to have is really a, it's a proxy. It's, it's, so if I really should go very quickly through the history of money in two minutes, and I'm, tr I'm going to try and make it interesting. Uh, in the beginning, uh, this was after God created man and woman. And, and, and um, so it's not really at the beginning, but a little later. Um, we know that the oldest money equivalent was actually written on clay. It was Manu owns Tomash two cows. And then people started, started sort of using that. So the first money was uh, clay money. It wasn't gold or any precious metal, or, or et cetera, et cetera. Today's money is, uh, let me see, well, it's 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 plastic, yeah. and and here sorry. Most of your money is 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 uh, is somewhere here. It's it, money isn't me. Money only exists in a relationship. If I establish my own currency, I, I could easily become a millionaire or, or trillionaire. But that doesn't really count. Uh, <laughs> Money is basically, fundamentally, a relationship thing. And if you ask, you actually, actually should try this. You should ask an economist what money is. If you want to confuse an economist, ask him or her what money is. Nobody really knows what money is. There was this German philosopher, Simmel, mm -hmm. who wrote a very, 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 very long book about money. After reading that book, you still will not know what, what <laughs> money is. <laughs> and um, uh, most of your money actually isn't even in, in, in paper, very unoriginal lithography. Um, it's in a bank. It's a digital recording of ones and zeros. You maybe have, I don't know, 200 euros maximum 
on you, but the rest of your money is somewhere in the bank. And if I want to send you money, what hap- this is, this is, I, I can't overstress this enough. What has to happen is, if I want to send you 10,000 euros, what happens is that from my account, assuming that I have 10,000 euros on my, which is a nice thing about economists, we can assume anything. It's a, dr- <laughs> it's, it's a little bit like Star Wars. I always say that, you know, um, uh, when I was younger, I used to watch Star Wars, and my father, who was older, uh, would watch it with me. Kids like to do this. And my father, w- but my father is a technical type. He's a pilot. And he would watch it, and he would say, you know, no, oh, that's not possible. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would never fly. And hey, come on, it's a, l- it's a laser blaster? That means the laser blasts will travel at the speed of light, which means you can't see them, and you can definitely not you know, <laughs> duck them. And, you know, he had very many, very, very, very good points. And I realized that, you know, we call this science fiction, so economics is social science fiction. Uh, if you want to watch Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, you sort of have to accept that elves exist, that traveling with Chewbacca is possible, and, and then you can watch... Star Wars, but you really have to do a, a belief exercise and forget about all the rules of physics, and, and otherwise you will not be able to watch it for more than five minutes. In the same way, this is, I, I think, not exactly the same, but very similar um, psychological procedure when you enter the realm of economics. There's also very, very, very many things you have to believe. For example, you have to believe that you know, human beings are rational, you have to believe, you have to, for example, talking about money, you have to believe in money. This is, this is a belief of our time which is, uh, which is sort of channeled into a symbol, you know, like Jesus Christ, when God becomes material human being. This is abstract trust becoming uh, physical. physical. But it's all, at the end of the day, it's a cryptocurrency. It's yeah. a proxy, it's an approximation, it's an agreement that we have between uh, each other. Let's talk about trust. I like this point. Women usually do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, also in nice <laughs> and also in relation to, the, to cryptocurrencies, because um, as we know, the last financial crisis, there were a big loss of trust uh, with all the bailout of, you should get a wallet, by the way. I always lose wallets. <laughs> this, this Same here. And the, yeah. the bad thing about wallets is you put in everything, and if you lose it, you've lost it all. If you distribute your risks ah. uh, yeah. in your pockets. Okay, that's a good concept. Okay, got it. Good, good. You, you can't lose it. a wallet if you don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the crisis. Okay. <laughs> So financial crisis, 2008, and uh, that was also the day uh, when, when everyone lost trust in this money system, or it seemed like that, with the bank bailout and all that stuff. Cryptocurrencies uh, rised, and, uh, and I was wondering, so how is this related, money and trust? What's mm. your perspective on that? Um, I think there are a few things to, to, to say to that. Um, but first, let me start with Star Wars. Uh, because um, there is a great evidence, empirical evidence, um, you might want to look into. Uh, if we talk about trust, it's always just, as Tomas pointed out, uh, a trust built in social communities. Um, but different social communities have different things they trust in. There might, there might be similarities, um, but if you um, have a look in the, in the empirical evidence of who's watching Star Wars and who's watching Star Trek, at least in the US, that correlates very strong with your political belief. Star Trek doesn't have the money system we have by now. It's mainly seen by liberal and left people. Mm-hmm. Star Wars is very much about power structures and so on and so on. It's mainly seen by conservative people. Um, so that explains it. Yeah, right? <laughs> but coming back to your question. Um, if you follow Dirk Becker, trust is the only thing you can trade. Banks do nothing else than offering you trust and you pay for it. Um, now, if you don't trust the intermediary in the in the system, um, why should you pay him? And that is, even if, if cryptocurrencies didn't arise um, in any correlation with the crisis, 
Um, the idea is, is, is very old. Um, by now we have the technological way to make it happen um, in, a, in a way that my generation loves globally. But um, we, if we go back in history, we see um, the ray stones. I don't know, ray stones, ray stones. It's like um, it used to be a payment method um, on, on little islands in micro Indonesia. Um, and what they did is they took a stone and every family got a stone. And on the stone, they marked if you traded something with your neighbor. And at some point they said, we don't need to mark that anymore because yeah, let's be honest, there are like 10 families living on this island. We can just agree on and um, agree on and agree on who owns whom what. Well, that's basically the same philosophy between uh, uh, behind the blockchain. Um, you have, without any intermediary, a system that allows you to be very sure about who owns whom and there is no bank earning money with it. So there's no bank you have to trust in. Um, and if you put that in a very broad history of, 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 of money, um, there are people saying that you started by commodity-based money. Now you can go by David Greiber and say that no, it's, it's not, that is not even true. But let, let's, let's assume it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you started by uh, uh, commodity-based uh, uh, currencies. We're now in a um, politically-based currency system. Your trust is not in the money, just as Tomas pointed out, but your trust, you can argue, if, if I own you money, you're trusting the political system that if I don't pay you, would force me to do. And we're going into a math and algorithm based way of trusting each so other. So it's that interpersonal, it's system trust. If you take it's it from It's a Lumen. trust in the idea that, or it's a belief to put it that way, the new religion of algorithm, if you want to put it that way, which is, yeah. can be seen very critical as well. But in a, in a village you know each other, but with the blockchain you are kind of anonymous. So yep. it's just a number. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not um, trusting you. I'm trusting the number. Because I'm trusting a system which is open source and, it, and decentralized, and I'm trusting the fact that my computer is constantly checking on math problems, on algorithms, um, and so are a million others. There are around about two million people using cryptocurrencies by now, different kind of cryptocurrencies. And if one of those people tried to um, create his own money or do whatever, the transaction that would be the fundament of that um, new money wouldn't, would be rejected by millions of other computers that came to a different mathematical conclusion on the same mathematical problem. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it, Tomasz? It, it, it really is, it's actually, <coughs> we, uh, yeah, the question is, that, you know, there is a boycott of trust. I had, uh, with another great thinker, Oliver Tanzer, in, in Krems, we had this debate, and it was very similar, and in the, in, in, in the host asked us, you know, this was in 2009, uh, there is nothing to trust anymore. And I said exactly the other way around. There is everything to trust. Mm -hmm. And the problem, and this is exactly uh, as you were saying, we now know there is everything to trust and everything to believe. Money, for example, only works if you believe in it. Right. Yeah. So uh, the problem in my reading of the world isn't that there was, you know, um, too little trust. No, the problem was that there was too much trust before 2007, 2008. Blind trust. Kind yeah, of no, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all trust is, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, so blind. Yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise, it, it, it wouldn't be trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, in, in that way, also yeah. money is, in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in maybe we could also, I don't know what you think, maybe in that way, if trust is blind, then money is also, in a way, following that, that logic. But our problem was that we religiously and I have nothing against religion. I believe everything. I even believe in UFOs. I believe in Star Wars. And I even believe in Star Trek. I'm sort of a very um, <laughs> um, bisexual when it comes to, you know, that Star Wars hates the Star Trek. You know this. Yeah, there is this sort of. But if you start by Lord of the Ring, both other worlds would be possible yeah, in exactly, the same exactly. reality. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't so, know so, that. The, so the problem, or the, 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 the real problem was that we trusted too much. We automate, money is in a way maybe automated trust. You don't have to examine whether I trust you or not. 
I out money automates that mm -hmm. for me. It's a it's a uh, it's a, a, so when you buy a painting by somebody, Damien Hirsch, Hirsch, for example, you're not the value isn't really in the painting. The value is in the piece of paper which says this was painted by Damien Hirsch. Mm -hmm. That's where 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 the value comes from because it is a trusted source some trusted i don't know expert on art or or damien himself writes this the value of the painting the aesthetic value of the painting isn't really the value component um, of it and that's exactly that's why we have all the holy symbols on money if you if you ever realize not on euros so much because it's <laughs> very important that's also i love it because on euros it's impossible to find a holy symbol for yeah. all of us because most of our holy symbols were assholes to somebody else <laughs> yeah. so that's why you have bridges and and and, and sort of neutral to things neutralize on, it. yeah on, on, okay. on, on euros <laughs> but otherwise typically a nation puts the most holy symbols on its currency. Uh, capital, historical figures, saints, the signature of, uh, of, 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 the, of the chairman of the, of the, of the bank, mm -hmm. or uh, you have the holy symbols of a nation, you know, da 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 da. And that is exactly <coughs> there only to make that piece of paper you know, valuable with all all symbols that we that we possibly have, we all put them on our banknotes. Yeah. But bes besides value and trust, money and currency are also enablers. So if we look at what do cryptocurrencies serve and given, uh, let's say, to society, and with the amount of right before the start, we discussed Islamic State as issuing own currency. So we're looking at two different. Totally well, they're different trying. They're not yet there. So let's say. Thankfully. So what would that mean? On one hand, you have cryptocurrencies uh, evolving, and then you have the Islamic State issuing its own currency. What? Uh, how do you see that? No, I love I love what you said about money being actually rather a political uh, political contract. Contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can see this perfectly. I mean, who would who would tr use the money of the uh, IS? You know, right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the same way. You know, there's all these giveaways, of course. I mean, this is the beautiful thing. Most of the things are written in the very language itself. Mm -hmm. For example, we call the crisis credit mm -hmm. crunch. Credit in Latin means trust. Coming back, credo. Those mm -hmm. of you who go to, to masses know that, you know. So it's, a, it's, it's literally, you don't even have to translate it. It's a faith crunch. And that's how we've been calling it all these years. It's a faith crunch. What we believed before we can no longer believe so we are in the state i would even liken it like now that you talk about religion um, it's sort of a protestant revolution without the without calvin <laughs> we no longer want to accept that the catholic uh, way of approaching god is the only way we know <clears throat> we know this but we don't have any figure to uh, to follow we're looking for a new uh, Calvin or, or, or um, the other guy. Or we're looking for many Calvins. What's the name of the or guy? Or Luthers. Luther, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for many of them at the same time. Because if money is blind, just as Tomas said, um, the, the real question is, and that goes back to the ancient philosophy as always as well, who do you choose to tell you to interpret um, the faith. Who tells? Who do you allow to tell you your story? Exactly. This is the most important thing in our lives: is who will be telling the story. And the beautiful thing about cryptocurrencies is that um, we're now free to listen to as many different stories as we want, because it enables, in a way, um, everybody, that including, unfortunately, the ES, to come up with the. Old, no, well, they do it in a very old way, right? They have these gold and silver. Uh, commodity based thing right. but um, you can easily come up and we've seen this with different types of cryptocurrencies now cryptocurrency as a technology and as a vision is much broader than Bitcoin Bitcoin is what, what it's what's discussed Bitcoin is which what what was run was around for most of the time that is a very um, libertarian um, way of interpreting uh, and telling a story while for example, Freikoins uh, are following a specific um, school of thoughts on, on coins. They came up with a coin which is losing automatically value uh, 
by time because they believe that that is a, a, a stable way of building an economy. So you're free to come up with the money which technically, um, based on the algorithms which you choose, um, tells a story you want to hear. Um, so we we'll, might end up having parallel uh, storytellers if you want so on the marketplace and you're free to choose um, what story you, you prefer. Also here, the question is now you're telling the story of a, it's going to be, it's very open, it's open source, it's egalitarian maybe even in a way. But when you have players like Warren Buffett, and he once said something like, the secret of getting rich is to be greedy when others are fearful and to be fearful when <laughs> others are greedy. Mm. So it's all about greed and fear, and we hear these terms. And mm. how much space is in the blockchain to for, for individuals to take advantage of that? On How much space on whose blockchain? In, in general, there might like be in there might be very little on yours and a lot of uh, in mine. Okay. Because um, we so think of this as um, what would be a good example. Um, think of this as MySpace, Facebook. Um, what we're discussing right now and what Bill Gates says is like at the same state uh, uh, level the internet was in the early 90s. We have no idea what exactly the impact is, but we know the impact is might end up being huge. <laughs> Um, if Bitcoin or any other currency we see right now is the MySpace uh, or the Facebook, we don't know. We're interested in um, the philosophy and the mythological uh, impact of the idea of a social network. So that you have to, to, to differentiate. Um, we don't have an, haven't even seen the beginning of, of what can be built, what stories can be told. Um, by this new technology. But, but then let me ask you, because earlier you said there is no invisible hand any longer, and maybe we agree that Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market is not as invisible as he thought, and, but what you're describing is a process that is not clear to everybody, so there must be invisible f uh, powers um, at hand. What do you think these are? Well, there are always invisible powers in the hand. For example, I don't know, love, uh, beauty, uh, this thing is not you. you see, he's smiling because he's frustrated, right? That's no, not absolutely what he was not. To. <laughs> the funny thing is, the, the question is, <laughs> why can't it be love and trust? And there you go. Here? There you <laughs> go. You know. so I'm That's very for happy inviting to, clever panelists. Is, uh, you know, you don't have to ask. <laughs> wonderful to hear. So, but how does it relate to what we're talking? I about? I mean, also it reminds me because you also said once that that uh, uh, money is something like it's more like an energy. Yeah, and I think it's also related to that question, you know, yeah. when it say it's it's triggered by fear and 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 greed. So, so the first thing to realize, I think, the key to understand fear is. In every fear, there is a little bit of desire, and in every desire, there is also a little bit of fear. These emotions never come clean, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You're falling in love. You want to uh, be with her. <laughs> <laughs> You are indulged in desire, but of course there is this extremely erotically beautiful component of fear, and vice versa. You watch a horror movie, or you know, because you want to enjoy fear, but there is also a strong component of of desire for that. The dynamics of that have not yet been clearly um, uh, described. So that's um. That's uh, point number one. Point number two is, again, like you, let's go all the way from the beginning when we as mankind learned to write. There was this guy called Plato, and or Socrates, we don't really know which one. But um, he had this prophecy and he said, uh, spirit is, this, was, this is sort of in Plato in one sentence, if I may. Um, of course, it's going to be simplified. Uh, he said that spirit will emancipate itself over matter. And this is, if I may say, a little detour, but actually completely related to the digital. At this time and age, mankind is moving from this earth to the world of digital. You see it around you. This is one sentence in which I would use to describe our generation. In the, in, you know, in the pre, prehistoric times, there was this great movement of nations. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you say it in, in, in German or in English? 
Völkerwanderung. So this is exactly happening again, but we as mankind are moving into the digital. Just, just mark how much of you is already in the cloud. Funny enough, this is also something that Jesus spoke about, about heaven. We sort of have this image that it's in the clouds. We are moving there. It's a fantasy world. It's a fantasy world, just like money is a fantasy world in, in, in Star Wars and in economics and everything. It's a fantasy world into which we are slowly moving. So it's going to be a little bit like... And, and a lot of people resist this. They don't like the idea and say, no, we want to, you know, I want to touch the... I even think in 10 years, we, shoe production will go bankrupt. We will move into the realm of abstract virtual reality, or as philosophers call it, real virtuality, which I think is a nicer uh, way. And what happens to the material world then? It will be like a forest. You go to... The, we come from the forest. We all know that. Today, you go to the forest once twice a year sort of i don't know why you know but we don't live there mm -hmm. anymore we don't live in the forest our habitat is in cities and the same way i think in 10 years or maybe maximum 20 years in the same way we will go to reality in the same way we go to the forest today once twice three times a year just to feel more real that's why we go to the forest uh, this is how we will go back to reality we will you know, have, and that's where you put your shoes on. But otherwise, um, and, and these cryptocurrencies is a nice example, or maybe a leading example, of how we are moving into the fantasy world where everything is possible. You dream it, it will be real. Uh, another beautiful example to look at, um, also to see where how the correlation, how strong the correlation between the religious or mythological or whatever to call it, uh, belief systems and modern technology is is the whole concept of longevity um, which uh, Google and other actors are putting in billions of dollars by now and there is a, um, a th school of thought in that longevity movement um, which at the very very early stage in, in the concept of transhumanism pointed out that the next step for humanity will be you live your daily life uh, in virtual reality yeah where you will be immortal yep. which is an old idea as we all know from thomas book uh, gilgamesh was looking for um now it's that's an easy thing to do in in 20 30 years you might just continue to live after you've died uh, as an avatar yep. mm -hmm. I don't, i'm not saying that's good or evil but uh, that's how, something how many of you have tried the virtual glasses is there anybody here you have you know how immersively wonderful world it's very lonely that's the only thing that i it doesn't have to be but it's sort of <laughs> it's a world where uh you can travel in time you can travel in space if a comet hits us we will just download you only already now i could download 80 percent of you i know your desires or google knows your desires your preferences your money we already now are I don't know what 60 I don't like numbers but let you know 60% of us is already in this world mm -hmm. with one leg we're there with the other we still sort of like the real but otherwise um, there if a planet hits the earth no problem we can just send uh, a, a, a data bank so in my most abstract imaginations very s imagination we will leave a body behind and we will move we will upload or download it's funny actually uh, like the soul then? upload download you know heaven hell we we'll upload <laughs> ourselves or, or download <laughs> into into uh this digital world where possibly this is what philosophers speak as we as we talk if it's possible to take a human soul and move it to the digital world completely. So you would live in your motherboard. And it's also funny that we actually call it motherboard. Mm. And, and we'll have, just, just as, as an addendum to discussions you might want to look into or wait for, I am waiting for the Catholic Church view of uh, the theological aspects of a yeah. uh, transferred soul. It's like reincarnation, but just 
through a program then. No, do, it's, Same it's, with it's, teleporting. It's, it's, Can you teleport a soul? Can you upload a soul? Well, if we have apes, but well, that's that's a totally different discussion. But if we have apes that uh, genetically are modified to be more intelligent, there are actually uh, which is scholars. what happened to us. Exactly. So it can happen again. So there are there are scholars in the Catholic dogmatic uh, discourse who point out that at some point it's very hard. It's very artificial to make a difference uh, between who's getting uh, God's love and who's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a discussion to to look into. Yeah. But I have it's to a quote lot of fun. you, Thomas. You write in your book. You said. We have given too much power to mathematicians and lawyers and taken it away from philosophers and writers. So does that fit then with their with crypto and you know that's a great quote to, 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 to do mathematics. in the Soho House, I guess. Because how many lawyers are here? Probably none, none. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Payback time. <laughs> um, so um uh, when you, for those of you who have seen the virtual world, it really is a world. Um, what you see, the way you, f- so, so to explain to the rest, the way you look into the virtual world is you put on uh, glasses. You can actually even do it with a, with a Google Cardboard. You put your cell phone uh, in front of your eyes, so it's a, it's, 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 it's a blindness in a way. And there are magnifi- magnifying glasses that make you see, so you look around you and you can define uh, where you are and, and art will go there immediately. I mean, in the beginning we started, this is also interesting, it would be a wonderful debate how art and technology follow each other. So in the beginning artists were, you know, painting you know, flowers and, and, you know, human beings or whatever, you know, a representation of the real. And then art has already, art is already in the abstract. Nobody's painting flowers anymore. Artists are completely in the world of abstract. You know, you know this. You know, triangle, and everybody goes like, "Wow, what is it? <laughs> 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 that's a, that's a fucking triangle, right?" <laughs> and, uh, and there must be some meaning, but that meaning is never interpreted. You know, you must, you, the artist must never. This is the difference between artists and, and the sciences that artists must never interpret what he or she actually meant. <laughs> there are good reasons for that. And <laughs> uh, but when you see, so, so, so art will very soon, you will be buying worlds instead of buying a painting. The difference between virtual reality and the world as we know it today is that all our fantasies had a frame. So painting has a frame, TV has a frame, iPod has a frame, um, your, your, everything had, has a frame. So it, you know... It only represents five percent of your or your of your visual s- s- scheme. In virtual f- reality or real virtuality, there are no frames. So an artist will create a world for you of elves or of goblins or or, or, or some fly through spaces, and there will be no longer no 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 frames. It will completely escape that i don't know if is anybody um familiar with the mit brain orchestra that's a lovely project um by which they use this virtual reality aspects to enable people to uh, compose and play music without um the need uh, of learning an instrument now you can discuss if that's like comparable art to the old masters um, but you're empowering people uh, to enjoy music and art uh, directly by giving them the technology of that. The last instruments are like the most weird one you can think of. They don't even look close to anything that um, that, that we believe to, to be an instrument. Um, but I believe that's cool because why shouldn't those, why should we, um, and that's a question of social justice if you want to as well, why should we um, only... Uh, uh, why should we only use the technology we used to have uh, and only allowing people to be able to use money if they are credit worthy by MasterCard if they, why, to, to play music if they learned the ancient uh, techniques of playing piano um, to travel between countries if they have the right passport um, 
we can by now discuss these things because we might not need all those rules and regulations anymore. We might need new ones, but um, fantasy can be more free today than it used to be, I guess. But, but in a way, your, your fantasy world, as much as I believe in it and trust one day it may come, um, it is also uh, sorts of an elitist uh, conversation because uh, looking at uh, where the wealth is and how it's distributed and as in your book yourself, you're saying where money is going, how it's accumulated. Um, how do you think this accumulation w can change in the next 20 years to lead such yeah. to mm -hmm. such a world where digitalization will be accessible to the majority of society to come to that state? I mean, you said we, we exited the body-centered, we entered the mind-centered. Maybe the next thing would be emotion-centered. Yeah. Absolutely. Global empathy. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so absolutely. How do we are entering a, a, an, an era of emotions. Uh, it used to be era of, of material stuff, axes, arrows. That's how we used to dominate each other. Then there was a two, three hundred years of mind, of philosophers, you know, lawyers. That was the per lawyer is a perfect <laughs> example of that. Lawyers are a technical instrumentalization and what i wanted to say about you know artificial reality it's you get digital images into your eye that digital image is a wormhole into yourself that digital computer is only a way of structuring your imagination i would even not say structuring your thoughts but structuring your imagination so that cell phone tv or whatever you're watching isn't really a fantasy space there. In, in it, it is a structured civilizational gateway, a wormhole in your pocket that uh, helps you organize. You have no. You fantasize about a guy, if you're a girl, or actually, <laughs> doesn't matter in Berlin. Doesn't matter in Berlin. You fantasize about a person, but you cannot. Your fantasy collapses immediately you're in love with somebody you close your eyes you try to imagine him or her you cannot you will maybe remember that he has pointy ears and sharp teeth but um, uh, <laughs> all other details you cannot you cannot hold or maintain your fantasy this is this is a this is a very strange component which I think will become very important in the future debate about this abstraction is that in fact, we need tools to help us structure our imagination. So if I want to tell a story, I can't, even if I'm rolling, uh, I can't really tell the whole Harry Potter story in my imagination. I have, I have some thing, but I have to write it. I have to have a pen, I have to have a paper, and I have to have a lot of paper. In the same way, this is a computer program. I am helping my imagination, structuring it in in some one zero or other language in interpretation this is our imagination as wonderful as it is as artificial reality creates a world that is absolutely i mean if you uh, my dream because i'm quite religiously um um sort of i enjoy the the, the mythology of, of of to me orgasm is when your symbols get all mixed up but nevertheless <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. But nevertheless, I would like to see the, the, the book of the Apocalypse of St. John, you know, the final book of the Bible in virtual reality. And that's possible. And I can travel seven heavens and seven hells in virtual reality. And there, are, there are um, high schools um, that are using uh, Assassin's Creed, a game uh, that is built up on, on brilliant graphics uh, or brilliant by the standards of now um, for teaching. Um, I don't see the point why I should uh, not, as a student, be able to travel and while learning about uh, old Rome or whatever... Uh, Without being there. Exactly. Mm. No, but it's, that's fine. I mean, I think in uh, 2004, maybe even two, it was the Virtual Troia was a project that uh, um, I remember some scientists were working on and uh, explored the possibilities as an educational tool, as a historic tool. Um, but again, these are tools, uh, meaning somebody's going to make money. These, these sound like business cases. How do you think right. we'll get away from that, what you said, right. uh, okay. collective uh, emotional society, co co global cohesiveness? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is something interesting that Slavoj Žižek, our favorite, absolutely crazy, but genius thinker, says 
about Coca-Cola. He says Coca-Cola is, uh, is, is, is a perfect communist drink. Uh, 